If you'd like to see examples of this, both movies and still shots, it's pretty remarkable. There's a paper that I'll provide a link to in the show note captions. This was published in the journal Neuron, Cell Press Journal, excellent journal, entitled Psilocybin Induces Rapid and Persistent Growth of Dendritic Spines in the Frontal Cortex in Vivo. So these measurements were done in the mouse equivalent, more or less, of the prefrontal cortex. There's some interesting details in this paper, for instance, that those new connections persist. So they don't just grow out during the psilocybin being active in the bloodstream and brain of the animal, they persist, okay? So this may, again, may explain some of the persistent changes that occur in people after psilocybin journeys. They may too grow new spines. I should also mention that a reduction in the number of dendritic spines, these little mushroom-shaped protrusions in the frontal cortex neurons of humans occurs in depressed patients. We know that from post-mortem tissue and that drugs that relieve depression or that treatments, including behavioral treatments that provide some relief from depression do seem to be correlated with increases in spine growth in frontal cortex neurons as well. So this raises a very interesting idea, which is perhaps it's the growth of new connections, these new dendritic spines, in particular neurons that's created by administration of psilocybin that explains the relief from depression that people experience. So this is just one paper, but it's one paper of a growing body of work showing that yes, indeed, psilocybin induces both structural and functional plasticity in the human and animal brain. It does that in the human brain at therapeutic doses of anywhere from 10 to 25, perhaps even 30 milligrams per session, one or two sessions. I should mention that the mouse studies tended to use quite high doses of psilocybin. I was actually, I wasn't shocked, but I was somewhat um, wide-eyed for a moment to realize that most of the studies looking at changes in plasticity in the mouse brain in response to psilocybin use the equivalent of one milligram per kilogram of body weight, which is if you do the math and you translate what we were talking about before in terms of dosages, I'll just spare you all the time. It's about double the sorts of dosages that are typically used in humans, maybe even triple in some cases. Now it's often the case in animal studies because of the metabolism of animals being different, but also because you know, seeing effects of drugs in animal studies can be difficult. Um, they did use a dose response anywhere from zero to 0 0.25 to half to one to two milligrams per kilogram of psilocybin in the study. So they had a dose response curve, but focused mainly on this one milligram per kilogram dosage. In any event, the point is that many of the studies that describe these pretty dramatic structural changes in the animal brain, most typically the mouse brain in response to psilocybin, use dosages of psilocybin that if translated to humans would be about double the human therapeutic dose. So that is something that we need to take into consideration. Nonetheless, it's very clear that in both animal studies and humans, psilocybin is inducing both structural and functional changes in brain circuitry, and that in humans, the network connectivity is being changed dramatically. We talked about those data earlier and that the underlying basis for that might be, again, might be, we don't know for sure, the addition of new dendritic spines on these pyramidal neurons that we've been talking about repeatedly throughout today's episode. Although neurogenesis, perhaps, and other modes of neuroplasticity, such as the elimination of certain connections, perhaps related to unhealthy maladaptive thoughts or our feeling that a particular sad song is overwhelmingly sad. It could be the case that those sorts of things change subjectively because of the removal of neural connections. If you're going to think like a neurobiologist or scientist for that matter, you don't ever want to think that one mechanism can explain all the effects of a given drug or a given experience. It's almost certainly likely to be the consequence of multiple mechanisms acting in parallel. And because I know there are people out there who would like to know even more about the neuroplasticity induced by psychedelics, including psilocybin. There's a wonderful review that I provide a link to in the show note captions entitled Psychedelics and Neuroplasticity, a Systematic Review Unraveling the Biological Underpinnings of Psychedelics. This review is great because it goes a step beyond just psilocybin, psilocin binding to the serotonin 2A receptor and things like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It actually talks a lot about the intracellular signaling and exactly how neurons change their excitability patterns based on this activation of the serotonin 2A receptor. It's probably more detail than most of you out there are interested in, but if you are interested in that level of detail, this is a wonderful open access review.